right, so apparently my slides disappeared into like the internet ether, so we're going to do this without those. So my story really began when I was 13, when a close family friend who was like an uncle to me actually passed away from pancreatic cancer. And when the disease hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more. So I went online to find answers. And using just Google and Wikipedia, I found a variety of resources on pancreatic cancer. But what I had found really shocked me. You see, 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. And as I dug deeper, I found an even more shocking piece of information. The current test is extremely outdated. I mean, it's 60 years old. I mean, that's older than my dad. <laughs> but also, it's grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all cancers, and it costs $800 per test. And your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have the cancer in order to give you this test. And so I was sure there had to be a better way. And so armed with ninth grade biology, I set out to change the field of cancer diagnostics. Bit lofty of a goal, however, I was going to do it. And my kind of rationale was, the current test is just so crappy that if I do anything, it will probably be marginally better. So then I kept going, and I found what a sensor would really have to look like in order to be effective at diagnosing the cancer. It would have to be inexpensive, rapid, sensitive, selective, minimally invasive, and then also it would have to be user-friendly. And so then I was looking at these, and I was like, well, this, this is going to be pretty easy. I can probably manage this. I wasn't exactly sure how, but I was going to do it. And then I found why we are currently having such a large problem at diagnosing the cancer. And that's because when we're looking for the cancer, we're looking at your bloodstream, particularly for these variations in protein molecules. And while this sounds really straightforward, it's anything but. You see, you have these liters and liters of blood that's already abundant in countless numbers of proteins. So it's like trying to find a needle in a stack of nearly identical needles. However, I was undeterred due to my teenage optimism, or how some people label it, complete and utter ignorance of the entire field of cancer research. And I persisted on, and I went back to any high schooler's best sources for information, Google, Wikipedia, how I got through every high school test and quiz. And then I stumbled across this database of 8,000 proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have these different types of cancers. And it was my summer break, and at the time, I was extremely antisocial. I really didn't go out during the summer unless it was for kayaking. And so I locked myself in my room and researched all 8,000 proteins. And at the end of the summer, I was really doubting my potential for any future social interaction. I mean, who locks himself in the room and researches 8,000 proteins? And it made for some really interesting back-to-school essays and some really awkward moments with the teacher. So you're like, oh, to my friend, oh, what did you do? I went to Yellowstone. And then she asked, Jack, what did you do? I researched proteins. And so that led to me getting the epithet, protein kid, I never could shake that off for the next three years. However, I kept going, and on the 4,000th try, I finally found one protein that could work. And the name of this protein was called mesothelin. And it's just your ordinary, run-of-the-mill type protein. Unless, of course, you have pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer. In which case, it's found these very high levels in your bloodstream. But the key is, is that it's found in the earliest stages of the disease. When someone has close to 100% chance of survival, so if you could detect this protein, then you could potentially detect the cancers in the earliest stage, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. However, now the real question was, how on earth am I going to detect this protein? I mean, that was the grand question here. And my answer came in a very unlikely place. High school biology class, the absolute stifler of innovation. Particularly with my biology teacher, we did not get along. So one day, tensions between me and her had escalated to record highs. And 
I rebelled how any teenager would. I smuggled in a sing an article on single-walled carbon nanotubes. I was going to show her some actual science. And I smuggled this in, and I felt really James Bond-esque. I had like, wedged it in between the pages of my textbook while we were supposed to be learning about uh, these different molecules. And I, a single-walled carbon nanotube is essentially a long, thin tube of carbon that's an atom thick, and one fifty thousandth that diameter of a single strand of your hair. And they're amazing. They're like the superheroes of material science. They have all these incredible properties. Like, they're stronger than steel. They conduct electricity better than copper. I mean, they're really the powerhouses of science right now. And I was reading about all these interesting properties while we were supposed to be learning about these things called antibodies. And an antibody, you can imagine it like a lock and key. It will only react with one specific protein, in this case, that cancer biomarker. So while I was reading this article, I all of a sudden had this epiphany. You could combine these two molecules. You see you have this network of nanotubes. And then you take these antibodies and weave it into the network, such that you have a carbon substance that will only react to one specific protein. But also, due to the amazing properties of these nanotubes, it will actually change how electricity flows through the network based on the amount of protein present. And it's similar to having a giant bowl of spaghetti and wedging some meatballs in there. And you can see that there would be less connections between neighboring spaghetti noodles. The same would be if you had carbon nanotubes and antibodies. There would be less connections. And that means there's less pathways for electrons to take while traveling through this network. And that, in turn, means that there's going to be an increase in electrical resistance and a decrease in electrical conductivity that you can measure using a $50 ohmmeter that you steal from your dad's garage. And it's now available at Home Depot. And he had no clue where it went for like four months, but then eventually he figured it out. However, then I was thinking, well, these networks of nanotubes are extremely flimsy. And since they're so delicate, they need to be supported. So I chose to use paper. And making a paper sensor for pancreatic cancer is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies, which I personally love. If I ever do bad on a test, you'd better watch out for the chocolate chip cookies or Oreos. One of the two will go. And all you do is you take some water, you pour in the nanotubes, add some antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and then you can detect cancer. And just as soon as I have this epiphany, I see out of the corner of my eye, my biology teacher, I swear she has eyes on the back of her head, she storms up to me all red in the face and snatches that article out of my hands like, what is this actual science doing in my classroom? <laughs> this is a place for the mundane regurgitation of knowledge. <laughs> she probably didn't say that. She probably said something more along the lines of, do your classwork or else I'm going to fail you. But I just said, well, she's probably saying something similar to that. And after class, after a 30-minute long spiel about how I had to respect myself and others and the teacher, I finally got my article back, and that's all I really cared about. And then I could start researching it. And as I kept researching this promising idea, I all of a sudden realized I'm probably going to need a lab to do this work. I mean, can't do cancer research on your kitchen countertop. Well, me and my brother had done some pretty crazy stuff. Like, for example, we made high-grade um, electronics in our basement that wiped out the power grid for the entire neighborhood. <laughs> We've also uh, cultured E. coli and cholera, where we make sandwiches. Luckily, there was no need to call the CDC in. And we've even landed ourselves on the FBI watch list for our Amazon ordering history. Well, my mom is, since we use her credit card. She wasn't too pleased about that. <laughs> However, I was going to need a lab to do this cancer research, so I was like, OK, I can just send out a bunch of emails. So I sent out 200 emails with this 30-page long manifesto detailing every aspect of my procedure. I sent it to these 200 labs at Johns Hopkins and the National Institutes of Health. And I sit back waiting for all these positive emails to pour in, for like, me to be on the cover of Time magazine, Jack and Draco saves the world. No, reality struck then. And I got 199 rejections. And you realized most professors aren't nearly as nice as those glowing profile pictures make them seem. Some actually went line by line through my procedure saying why it was the worst mistake I could ever make. However, I got through that, and I finally got one positive email from Dr. Anurban Maitra at Johns Hopkins University. 
And I go in for this big interview, clad in my traditional interview wear of uh, pajama pants and a hoodie, pretty professional stuff. And I was expecting the typical interview questions like, oh, what's your favorite color? What do you want to be when you grow up? Stuff like that. No, unfortunately, this guy had a PhD and knew his stuff. And he had this 30, like, um, 30 person board of PhDs that inquired, like, it was kind of an inquisition, except more brutal. And they would just fire away these questions, trying to sync my procedure. I guess to see, it worked pretty well on my SATs. However, I got through it, and eventually I landed the lab space I needed. And just as soon as I started, I realized just how ill-suited for the lab I was. For example, first day, it was like, oh, Jack, culture some cancer cells for us. And you literally transfer liquid from one flask to another flask. Pretty simple. I sneezed in my second flask. And I just kind of hid it away and didn't tell anyone about it. And then also I would like trip and drop my flask or blow it up in the centrifuge. And after a while, my professor was like, why on earth did I ever invite you into my lab? However, seven months later, after screwing up every imaginable scientific procedure, I finally ended up with one small paper sensor that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. This makes it 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than our current methods of detection. But also, the key is, is that I can detect the cancer in the earliest stage, when something has close to 100% chance of survival. And then also, in the next two to five years, this patent-pending sensor could potentially lift the once dismal pancreatic cancer survival rates from 5.5% to close to 100%, as its accuracy rate is over 90%. And it would do similar for ovarian and lung cancer. But it wouldn't stop there. You see, you can switch out that antibody, as simple as switching out chocolate chips for butterscotch chips. And you can essentially detect an entirely different protein, meaning an entirely different disease, range from Alzheimer's, other forms of cancer, even HIV, AIDS, and heart disease. The possibilities are literally endless. However, throughout this journey, I faced a number of difficulties. I mean, I got told no by my biology teacher. I got told no by 199 professors. I even got told no by my parents. Luckily, they didn't tell me to make a paper mache volcano for my science fair project. But one of the largest difficulties I faced was that of paywalls. You see, 90% of all scientific journals are locked tightly behind what's called a scientific paywall. And that means when you want to read it, you have to cough up $35. And for a young researcher such as myself, that makes the cost of doing research inhibitively expensive. I mean, it increases the cost exponentially. And we've, by having these paywalls, we've really instituted this fundamental barrier between the public and science, where the public can't really get access to all this information because there's this $35 behemoth in between them and the science. And we see all these big STEM initiatives saying we need more kids interested in science, but when a Katy Perry single costs 99 cents and a seminal science article costs $35, I mean, let's be real, I'm going to choose the Katy Perry single. However, this indicates something that is truly fundamentally wrong with our current publishing system, and it isn't just a problem for 15-year-old cancer researchers, this is a problem for everyone. Because Harvard University recently released a statement saying we simply can't afford to continue paying for these subscriptions, they're just too expensive. And that's because they cost $40,000 a year sometimes for these um, institutions per journal. And when Harvard University, the richest academic institution in the world, can't afford to continue paying for its subscriptions, what does that say about the flow of information, accessibility of knowledge, and dissemination of academia when they can't afford to pay for it? How can you expect 15-year-old young researchers to be able to pay for it? And by having these paywalls, we've really ha instituted this very fundamental knowledge hierarchy where essentially we have the knowledge upper class, universities and uh, big corporate labs that can afford these subscriptions. However, even in this knowledge elite, we have this kind of stratification where the top labs at those top universities have much more funding and much larger grants than those state institutions. So it's like essentially saying that those top institutions, they all can teach calculus and above while everyone else is relegated to only algebra one. And then we have the knowledge middle class. People are like you or me. 
We have access to the internet. We can access the 10% of open access articles that are free. But then also, we can maybe dish out like maybe $35 here and there for accessing these articles. But then we have the true underbelly of our knowledge society, where 85% of our words or 80% of our world's population, 5.5 billion people, lack access to the internet and any scientific information whatsoever. So we're living in a knowledge oligarchy where only 0.008% of the world's population can afford to access these articles. That's like taking the population of Los Angeles, taking 80 people off the street and saying those are the only people who can access knowledge. Everyone else, too bad for you. And then 80% of the people can't access the knowledge whatsoever. But imagine if we could live in a knowledge democracy, where what you look like, age or gender, don't apply, whether you're from Cambodia to China, from Malaysia to Mexico. It wouldn't matter if you're a billionaire or living on less than a dollar a day. You would have access to that information, because science shouldn't be a luxury, and knowledge shouldn't be a commodity. It should be a basic human right. Because the minds of the people must be free, and that means the minds of everyone not the minds of the select few who can afford these articles. And I believe that we can create this change, because think, if a 15-year-old who didn't know what a pancreas was could find a new way to detect pancreatic cancer, just imagine what we all can do together. Thank you. Ooh. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Deepak has a question. What are you working on now? I was just reading, I just tweeted out the People Magazine thing. Your book is coming out and was reading about water filtration. And I mean, you've got a lot of stuff stacked up you haven't even told us about yet. What's the, what's the coolest next thing? And then, and then Deepak's going to ask I you a question. That's the oh, Kira. <laughs> no, 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 go yeah. ahead. Please answer. So what's answer. the coolest next thing? I mean, you're, you're so old, too. My gosh. I mean, I wish you could have accomplished more in, your, in, in so many years. Isn't it remarkable at his age, everything that he has done? So um, I detail a lot of my new work coming out in my new autobiography that comes out in March. And then... Um, <laughs> His autobiography. <laughs> and uh, so one of the most exciting things I'm working on right now is we've essentially made out of recycled plastic water bottles a filter that filters out 95% of all heavy metals and pesticides in five minutes for 70 cents. So it's 120 times as expensive than our conventional filters, but also could be broadly extended to a bunch of different contaminants, such as fracking contaminants, oil spill, desalination. And right now we're planning on expanding it to both Ghana and then also Bangladesh. And then also I'm tinkering around with nanorobots and diagnostics on demand at Georgetown, so. He's tinkering around. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, cool. I'm blown away. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks so much. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.